Good afternoon. It is a great pleasure to welcome you all to this year's Holbrook debate. In particular, I would like to extend a warm welcome to uh, Professor uh, Slavoj Zizek, who is the keynote speaker this afternoon, and to Professor Tyler Cohen, who will interview Professor Zizek and chair the Q&A session. Welcome to all of you who are present here in the University Aula, and welcome to all of you who are following our live streaming of the event. The Holberg debate is organized by the Holberg Prize, which is administered by the University of Bergen on behalf of the Norwegian Ministry of Education and Research. The Holberg Prize is one of the world's largest and most prestigious prizes in the fields of humanities, social science, law, and theology. Since 2004, the prize is awarded annually to scholars who have made outstanding contributions in these fields. More generally, the purpose of the Holbrook Prize is to raise the status of the fields of the prize and to increase society's awareness of the importance of research in these fields. The Holbrook debate intends to follow up this purpose by focusing on academic and public discussion of issues that are both challenging for society and important in research. The Holberg Prize and the Holberg Debate are named after Ludwig Holberg, who was born in Bergen in 1684 and became professor at the University of Copenhagen in several of the fields covered by the Holberg Prize. He traveled extensively in Europe and played an important part in bringing the Enlightenment to the Nordic countries. He is also well known as a playwright, in particular for his comedies and satirical works on highly relevant social issues. The Holberg debate honors the legacy of Ludwig Holberg's ideas on democracy, equality, and human rights. In the first week of December each year, we celebrate Holberg's birthday by inviting prominent persons to debate some of the most pressing issues of our time. On Tuesday this week, on the 3rd of December, it was 335 years since Ludwig Holberg was born. The Holberg debate is a very meaningful way of celebrating Ludwig Holberg's birthday. Giving the floor to the academic director of the Holberg Prize, Professor Ellen Mortensen, I will again welcome all of you to this year's Holberg debate. Good afternoon. Welcome to all of you, whether you made it to the aula today or you are following the event via live streaming. The overwhelming interest in this year's Holber de debate is due to the fact that two of the most exciting academic intellectuals of our time, Slavoj Žižek and Tyler Cohen, have accepted the invitation to come to Bergen this December afternoon. As a new decade is approaching, we are faced with high levels of uncertainty, armed conflict, civil unrest, terrorist attacks, and political polarization occur with increased frequency throughout the world. Three decades after the end of the Cold War, the question of whether capitalism is able to cope with the current challenges remains highly contested. Today, we hope to be able to delve into this question while also touching on other aspects of Zizek's work. The program today is as follows. First, our keynote speaker, Slavoj Zizek, will deliver his talk for approximately 25 minutes. Immediately following his speech, Tyler Cohen will join him on stage to conduct an interview with Zizek for about 50 minutes. After the interview, there will be a Q&A session led by Professor Cohen, in which there will be some pre-recorded video questions for Zizek. We will also open up for questions from the audience and via Twitter, should we receive any tweets during the event. Now, without further ado, let me introduce the main speaker. Slavoj Žižek is a Slovenian philosopher and cultural critic. 
He is senior researcher in the Department of Philosophy, University of Ljubljana, and international director of the Birkbeck Institute for the Humanities, University of London. He also holds a position as global distinguished professor of German at New York University. Slavoj Žižek has written more than 50 books on topics ranging from political theory, cultural studies, psychoanalysis, film criticism, opera criticism, Hegelianism, and theology. Ever since his first book, The Sublime Object of Ideology, appeared in English in 1989, Žižek has reinvigorated Marxist thought through his re-readings of, among others, Marx and Lenin. Furthermore, he has provided new perspectives on modern as well as ancient aesthetics works, aesthetic works, often by intersecting innovative links to Hegel and Lacan. With books such as Tearing with the Negative, The Ticklish Subject, In Defense of Lost courses, Causes, The Fragile Absolute, The Universal Exception, The Parallax View, Violence, Less Than Nothing, Absolute Recoil, Like a Thief in Broad Daylight, and most recently, Sex and the Failure of the Absolute. Zizek has earned the position as one of the leading philosophers and intellectual of our times. He frequently engages in public debate, offering lucid and unorthodox analysis of current issues and phenomena. He is also participating in a number of film projects. The title of his talk today is Why I'm Still a Communist. I ask Slavoj Žižek to please enter the podium. Thank you very much. Thank you. Listen, don't applaud too much my old joke. Sorry, oh no, no problem. Keep the energy when we communists take over, you will have to. <laughs> no, but more seriously, because I speak too much, usually I have to be brief and go through fast. Uh, let me begin by expressing a sincere gratitude for this invitation. It's an honor for me, and also my love for Bergen the city. Uh, there is a well-known joke, in my country at least, about a small boy who asks his father, Dad, why don't they build cities in the countryside where the air is much cleaner? I know I'm wrong, probably, but Bergen comes, for me at least, pretty close to this idea. Okay, let me begin. Why am I still a communist when the communist dream of the 20th century is clearly over, together with the dreams of the dissident communists about socialism with a human face. I am also, as far as imaginable, from the old mantra that communism was a good idea which just got corrupted by totalitarian perverts. No, there are problems already in the original vision. As one, and one should submit to severe reassessment. Also, Marx himself, yes, communists in power did some good things. We know the litany, education, healthcare, fight against fascism and so on. But overall, the only real triumph of communists in power is, I think, what happened in China in the last decades arguably the greatest economic success story in human history. Hundreds of millions were raised from poverty. How did China achieve this? The 20th century left was defined by its opposition to two fundamental tendencies of modernity. The reign of capital with its aggressive individualism and alienating dynamics, and the authoritarian bureaucratic state Power. What we get in today's China is exactly the combination of these two features in its extreme form. Strong authoritarian state, wild capitalist dynamics. 
And this is the most efficient form of socialism today. China is becoming the model of what Henry Farrell called network, networked authoritarianism. If a state, that's the idea, spies on people enough and allows machine learning systems to incorporate their behavior and respond to it, it is possible to provide for everyone's needs better than a democracy could. That's the idea. But this isn't what's happening in China. China is very unstable, plagued by wildcat strikes, uh, concentration camps, massive corruption, and so on. This instability was signaled by a strange event in mid-October 2019. The Chinese media launched an offensive promoting the claim that, I quote, demonstrations in Europe and South America are the direct result of Western tolerance for Hong Kong unrest. Quote goes on. There are many problems in the West and all kinds of undercurrents of dissatisfaction. Many of them will eventually manifest in the way the Hong Kong protests did. End of quote. What cannot but, but strike the eye here is that the communist China discreetly plays on the solidarity of those in power all around the world against the rebellious populations, warning the West not to underestimate the dissatisfaction in their own countries, as if beneath all ideological and geopolitical tensions, they all share the same basic interest in holding on to power. These protests are not taking place only in poor and desolate country, like countries like Iran, but also in countries of relative, at least, prosperity. They express a growing dissatisfaction that cannot be channeled into established modes of political representation. What awaits us is a society of permanent state of exception and civil unrest. This strange protest wave enables us to take a fresh look at the fall of the Berlin Wall. It is a common place to emphasize the miraculous nature of the fall of the wall 30 years ago. Something happened that one couldn't even imagine a couple of months earlier. The communist regimes collapsed like a house of cards. However, one should add that an even greater miracle happened only a couple of years later, the return of ex-communists to power through free elections. Remember Poland, Valencia was totally marginalized and much less popular than General Jaruzelski, who crushed solidarity with a military coup d'etat. Now, two decades later, today, came the third surprise, Poland is now in the grip of rightist populists who reject both communism and liberal democracy. So what goes on? What the large majority of those who protested against the communist regimes had in mind, I claim, was not simply capitalism. They wanted social security, solidarity, a rough kind of justice, freedom to live their own life outside the oppressive state control, honesty, sincerity. They wanted to be liberated from the primitive ideological indoctrination and the prevailing, prevailing cynical hypocrisy. In short, the vague ideals that led the protesters were to a large extent taken from socialist ideology itself. And as we learned from Freud, what is repressed returns in a distorted form. In our case, what was repressed from the dissident imaginary returned in the guise of rightist populism. In his interpretation of the fall of East European communism, Jürgen Habermas proved to be the ultimate left Fukuyamaist. I'm referring, of course, to Fukuyama. Silently accepting that the existing liberal democratic order is the best possible. This is why he welcomed precisely what many leftists saw 
as the big deficiency of the anti-communist protests in Eastern Europe. The fact that they were not motivated by a new vision of some post-communist future. As Habermas put it, the Central and Eastern European revolutions were just what he called rectifying or catch-up Nachholende revolutions. Their aim was to enable Central and Eastern European societies to gain what the Western Europeans already possessed. In short, to rejoin the West European normality. However, the Yellow Vests and other similar protests are definitely not catch-up movements. The populist disappointment at liberal democracy is the proof that 1990 was not just a catch-up revolution. It aimed at more than liberal capitalist normality. Freud spoke about unbehagen in der Kultur, the discontent unease in culture. Today, 30 years after the fall of the wall, the ongoing new wave of protests bears witness to a kind of unbehagen in liberal capitalism. And the key question is, who will articulate this discontent? Will it be left to nationalist populists to exploit it? Therein resides the big task for the left. I will now refer to a movie that I hope you saw, although I don't like it. In the final scene of V for Vendetta, thousands of unarmed Londoners wearing Guy Fox masks march towards Parliament. The military allows the crowd to pass and the people take over. Okay, a nice ecstatic moment, but sorry for the plastic expression. I am ready to sell my mother into slavery in order to see V for Vendetta part two. <laughs> what I asked this at the end of the film, Triumph, people won over, what would have happened the day after the victory of the people? How would they reorganize daily life? I was never fascinated by hundreds of thousands assembling on a large square in Athens or Istanbul and so on. What interests me is the morning after, when the ecstatic passion is over. How will ordinary people experience the change? Thomas Piketty tries to address this issue in his second book. Capital and Ideology, he proposes a radicalized social democracy. Not to nationalize all wealth like the Soviet-style communism, but to maintain capitalism and redistribute assets. So, <coughs> sorry. Progressive income taxes should allow governments to give everyone a basic income equivalent to 60% of the average wage. Uh, and to cover the costs of decarbonizing economy, employees should have 50% of the seats on company boards, an individualized carbon tax calculated by a personalized card should track each person's contribution to global heating and so on and so on. But what if the rich decide to emigrate? Piketty proposes an exit tax and a global justice system that makes it impossible to hide from expropriation anywhere. To that end, he imagined a supranational parliament comprised of members drawn from national uh, legislators. The two extremes of the deadlock of today's radical left are best exemplified by a long TV dialogue between Piketty and the French Maoist, great philosopher, Alain Badiou. Badiou's vision is that of nomadic proletarians who will emerge as a new revolutionary force. Piketty's proposal is no less utopian, although it presents itself as pragmatic, looking for a solution within the frame of capitalism and democratic procedures. His utopia is that it can be done within this frame. You know, I agree with Piketty. I'm just saying, in order to do what he wants, there already a radical social change already has to happen. And he doesn't talk about this. There is, of course, now comes 
trigger warning for political correct people, now come my usual provocations. <laughs> there is a third dream, that of rejuvenated local democracy, which is, I think, if anything, even worse. The more our communities are self-ruling, relatively autonomous, the more they have to rely on a thick, thick texture of alienated institutional mechanisms. Where does electricity or water come from? Who guarantees the rule of law? To whom do we turn for health, healthcare and so on? So, that's my proposal. We should change the goal of emancipatory struggles from overcoming alienation to enforcing the right kind of alienation. How to achieve a smooth functioning of alienated, invisible social mechanisms which sustain the space of non-alienated communities. This is what makes welfare state so attractive to me. I don't have to help the poor myself. The state and its anonymous apparatuses do it for me so that I don't have to confront the excluded and underprivileged face to face. This is what is so dangerous for me about the process that began in ideology and practice with Margaret Thatcher. Recall her famous quip that society doesn't exist. There are only individuals who struggle and work, fully responsible for their fate. This introduces a kind of fake disalienation, a false repersonalization of social relations. The poor are ultimately responsible for their fate, and the aim of help should be to enable them to regain their responsibility. It is no longer the abstract state, it is me and other hardworking people who are covering the costs, and those who receive help are also personalized. They acquire faces, often faces of lazy and evil people, abusing our generosity. Is this in some sense not true? I think no, because the alienated system that regulates our lives is not just an illusion, but the actuality of our lives. In such a universe, every direct personalization, like the one proposed by Thatcher, is an ideological lie. So again, why do I still cling to the cursed name of communism when I know that the 20th century communist project failed? giving birth to a new form of murderous terror. Let me begin with the fact that we live in an age permitted by apocalyptic prospects, a proviso. When I talk about apocalyptic threats, I'm fully aware of how tricky this domain is. Only a thin line separates the correct perception of real dangers from the fantasy scenarios about a global catastrophe that awaits us. There is a specific enjoyment of living in the end time, living in the shadow of a catastrophe. And the paradox is that such a fixation on some forthcoming catastrophe is precisely one of the ways to avoid really confronting it. Rightist populists paint a catastrophic vision of our entire civilization under threat from Muslim and other refugees. If today's trends go on, so they say, in a decade or so, Europe will be a Muslim province of Europa. Stand. Plus, they, rightist apocalyptic thinkers, they see LGBT plus and political correctness as part of the cultural Marxist plot to destroy Western civilization. Muslim fundamentalists and political correct feminists are thus, for them, two sides of the same coin. Leftists focus on another couple of apocalyptic threats, ecology and digital control of our lives. Now, if we discount the so-called rational optimists who claim that life is nonetheless generally getting better, let me focus on three apocalypses to be taken seriously. Migrations, ecological threats, digital control. They all concern the fate of our commons, of what is the common ground of our existence. Natural environments, the global digital space, the unity of human species. These threats are by definition transnational. They cannot be approached within the frame of nation states which nation-states are today, unfortunately, making a comeback.
So let me begin with new forms of apartheid, which is the leftist version of the fear of immigrants. For the right, immigrants pose a threat to our way of life, while for the left, building new walls is a threat to our global civilization. While this is basically true, I would nonetheless like, second trigger, trigger warning, now you will really hate me, I would like to nonetheless point out that, that uh, we should reject the simple lesson of mutual tolerance best rendered by a well-known utter stupidity, I think, masquerading as a deep wisdom. Quote, an enemy is someone whose story you have not heard. I cannot imagine a more stupid thing to say. <laughs> Why? I know what they want to say. There is a wonderful literary example, Mary, she Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. In the central part of the novel, Shelley allows the monster to speak for himself, to tell the story from his own perspective. And in this way, she humanizes him. There is, however, a clear limit to this procedure. Whenever people tell me, oh, there are no enemies, enemies, somebody to whom you are not ready to listen to, my answer is, ah, good to learn. So Hitler was our enemy because we were not ready to listen to him or whatever. No, I think the more I know about and understand Hitler, the more he is my enemy. The ex now comes my lesson. The experience that we have of our lives from within, the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves in order to account for what we are doing are fundamentally a lie. The truth lies outside, in our actions, in what we do. These stories, the way we experience a situation, and I'm recently following ethnic cleansings done here and there, Bosnia, Rwanda. There always is a poet behind. These stories are usually written by poets. My thesis. Soldiers are not bad per se. What is bad are soldiers combined with poets. Soldiers mobilized by nationalist poetry or religion. There is no ethnic cleansing without poetry. Why? To do horrible things, most of us need to be anesthetized against our elementary sensitivity to others' suffering. And for this, a sacred cause is needed. Religious ideologies usually claim that, true or not, religion makes some otherwise bad people to do some good things. From today's experience, uh, I would rather stick to Stine Weinberg's claim that while without religion, good people would have been doing good things and bad people bad things, only a religion can make good people do bad things. Plato's reputation suffers because of his claim that poets should be thrown out of the city. I think in view of my post-Yugoslav experience, a rather good advice. In ex-Yugoslavia, poets, ethnic cleansing was clearly prepared by poets' dangerous dreams. In ex-Yugoslavia, instead of industrial military complex, we had the poetic military complex, much more dangerous, symbolized by the two names, Radovan Karadzic, Ratko Mladic, poet and a general. In a recent TV debate on German TV, Gregor Gysi, a key figure of Linke, the left party, gave, I think, a good answer to an anti-immigrant who aggressively insisted that he feels no responsibility for the poverty and horrors in the third world countries. Instead of spending money to help them, we should only be responsible for the welfare of our own citizens. The gist of Gysi's answer was, if we only, if we don't get responsible for the third world poor and act accordingly, they will come here to us, which is precisely what the anti-immigrant was ferociously opposed to. Cynical as this reply may appear, it is, I think, much more appropriate than abstract humanitarianism. The humanitarian approach appeals to our generosity and guilt. We should open our hearts to them, also because the ultimate cause of their suffering is European racism and colonialism. And this appeal is often combined by a strange economic reasoning. 
Europe needs immigrants in order to continue to expand economically. Our birth rates are falling. We are losing our vitality. It is strange to hear leftists evoke the typical rightist motive of vitality. The hidden stake of this operation are clear. Let's open ourselves to migrants as a desperate measure to avoid the much-needed radical change and to maintain our liberal capitalist status quo. The logic that sustains Gizi's statement, his statement, is the opposite one. Only a radical social economic change can protect our way of life. In some sense, a refugee is a neighbor, Neste neighbor in the strict biblical sense, the other reduced to his, her, their naked presence. Without possessions, without home, without a determined place in society, refugees are like a stain in the social edifice, always too close to us for a racist. Since they lack a stable place in our society, they stand for universality of being human. How we relate to refugees indicates how we relate to humanity as such. But in a properly Hegelian way, universality and particularity coincide here. Refugees come naked only materially, and for this reason, they all the more cling to their cultural identity. From this fact alone, it is clear, to me at least, that Nomadic immigrants are not proletarians. In spite of attempts by Alain Badiou and others to promulgate refugees into the exemplary figure of today's proletarians. What makes proletarians proletarians is the fact that they are exploited. They are the key moment of the valorization of capital. Their labor creates surplus value. In clear contrast to nomadic refugees who are not just perceived as worthless, from the racist perspective, but are, most of them at least, literally valueless. A trash remainder of global capital. Leftists and capitalists dream of the new wave of immigrants that they will be integrated into our capitalist machine, as it happened back in the 1960s in Europe and France. Since, again, they claim Europe needs immigrants. But this time, I claim it will not work. The bulk of them remains outside. This fact makes the situation of immigrant refugees very tragic. They are caught in a kind of social limbo, a deadlock from which fundamentalism offers a false exit. With regard to the circulation of global capital, refugees are put in a position of surplus humanity, a mirror image of surplus value and no humanitarian help and openness can resolve this tension, only a restructuring of the entire international edifice. There is a passage in Vladimir Putin's recent interview where one can feel how he really speaks from his heart. It occurs when he solemnly declares his zero tolerance for spies who betray their country. Quote, Treason is the gravest crime possible and traitors must be punished." End of quote. It is clear from this outburst that Putin has no personal sympathy for Snowden or Assange. He just helps them to annoy, in order to annoy his enemies. And one can only imagine the fate of an eventual Russian Snowden or Assange. One can only wonder at some Western leftists who continue to claim that in spite of his socially conservative stance, Putin poses an obstacle to the American world domination and should be for this reason viewed with sympathy. There are circumstances, I claim, when treason, the betrayal of one's own nation state, is the greatest act of ethical fidelity. Today, such treason is personified by names like Assange, Manning, Snowden. Why? The entire ethics of a state, of a nation state, culminates in the highest act of heroism, the readiness to sacrifice one's life for one's nation state. Which means that the wild barbarian relations between states serve as the foundation of the ethical life within a state. In today's North Korea, with its ruthless pursuit of 
nuclear weapons and rockets? Uh, is this not the ultimate example of the logic of unconditional national state sovereignty? The moment we fully accept the fact that we live on a spaceship Earth, the task that urgently imposes itself is that of civilizing civilizations themselves. And this brings us to the second apocalyptic threat, the, the commons of external nature, threatened by pollution and exploitation. I'm well aware how uncertain analysis and projections are in this domain. It will be certain what is going on only when it will be too late. What I nonetheless see as certain is that there is a prospect of a catastrophe here. Scientific data seem to me abundant enough. So we should act in some large-scale collective way. How? Ideology is today, I think, one of the major ideolo sorry, ecology is today one of the major ideological battlefields, with a whole series of strategies to obfuscate the true dimension of the threat. First, simple ignorance, Donald Trump. It's a marginal phenomenon, life goes on, don't worry. Second, science and technology can save us. Don't worry, scientists will come with uh, solutions. Three, leave the solution to the market, higher taxation of the polluters and so on. And the last two, which I really despise, four, the superego pressure on personal responsibility instead of large systemic measures. When you criticize the system, the answer you get is, but did you do your duty? Did you put all uh, uh, Coca-Cola cans on one side? Did you recycle all the paper? It's a wonderful formula. This is ideology at its best. Because first, it makes you responsible and it offers you an easy way out. Separate your, your Coca-Cola cans and you did your duty, you can go on. But the fifth, the worst version is for me, so-called deep ecology. The idea that we should renounce traditional life, uh, the arrogant life, uh, we should renounce human hubris and become again respectful children of our mother nature. This whole paradigm of mother nature derailed by our human excess is, I think, wrong. What mother nature? Mother nature is a dirty bitch. Just imagine all the catastrophes that happens on Earth before humanity. Where does oil come from? Where, uh, nature, is in, in, uh, nature is completely chaotic. Don't, don't, don't play the game of returning to balance. That's the problem. There is no natural balance. What all the talk about how we humanity pose a threat to the life on the Earth really amounts to is our worry about our own fate. What if we cause the end of human life on Earth? Earth itself is indifferent to it. Earth already went through many similar destruction, destructions. When we worry about environment, let's be at least honest, we worry about our own environment. We want our own good and safe life. Ideology is at its worst here. Why do we buy organic food? I don't know how it is with you, but all my friends admit to me the same point. Do you really believe that the half-rotten and expensive organic apples are really healthier? The point is, it's ideology. You feel good. You see, I bought them, although they are half-rotten, and it's pure ideology because in this way I did something for humanity and Mother Earth. I, that's ideology in our everyday life. So how to act? Now I go even further. Uh, we are in a deep mess. There is no simple democratic solution here. People talk as if uh, uh, politicians and corrupted scientists are covering up the truth. Okay, but what should we do? There are many desperate proposals. For example, uh, uh, SRM, solar radiation management, the continuous massive dispersals of aerosols into our atmosphere to absorb Sun sunlight and thus cool the planet. However, SRM is extremely risky. We don't know what it can trigger, maybe some unpredictable effects. So I think the first step to be serious is to admit 
that there is no simple, clear way out. It's, it's a very sad, confused, complex situation. The least we can do is set the priorities straight and admit the absurdity of our geopolitical war games when the very planet for which, we are, for which wars are fought is under threat. That's where we should begin. This brings me to the third threat, the commons or internal nature. When the threat posed by the digitalization of our lives is debated in our media, the focus is usually on the new phase of capitalism called by Shoshana Zuboff surveillance capitalism. Quote, knowledge, authority and power rest with surveillance capital, for which we are merely human natural resources. We are the native peoples now whose claims to self-determination have vanished from the maps of our own experience." End of quote. So we, the watch, are not just material. We are also exploited, involved in an unequal exchange, which is why the term behavioral surplus is justified here. When we are surfing, buying, watching TV, and so on, we get what we want, but we give more. We lay ourselves bare. We make the details of our lives and its habits transparent to the digital big other. The paradox is that we experience this unequal exchange, the activity which effectively enslaves us, as our highest exercise of freedom. What is more free than freely surfing on the web? Just by exerting this freedom of ours, we generate the surplus appropriated by the digital big other which collects data. However, and don't be afraid, I am coming <laughs> to an end. Uh, important as this surveillance capitalism is, I think it's not yet a true, the true game changer. I see a much greater potential for new forms of domination in the prospect of direct brain-machine interface. All kinds of secret agencies are working intensely on it. What we learn is just the public face of it, the often sensational news about it in our public media, like, you know, a totally crippled man now with his mind alone can make objects move and so on and so on. Yeah, but what about billions, billions invested by military machinery into direct mind control and so on and so on. Uh, where do I see a threat here? Again, a threat in this idea that our mind processes can directly interact without communication media like language and so on with the machine. Uh, the distance between our inner life, the flow of our thoughts, and external reality is the basis of our self-perception as free beings. We are free in our thoughts precisely because I am aware that what I think stays with me. I can play with my thoughts, I can make thought experiments, engage in dreaming and so on, with no direct consequences in reality. This is now potentially under threat. And just don't tell me, oh, it will take centuries till we do it. At an elementary level, it's already happening. Was it reported in your media that I read somewhere two, three weeks ago that in China, I don't like to focus on China because we like to report things about China to paint them as these eccentric totalitarians, but we are doing the same thing in maybe gentle way. In order, for example, in some uh, elementary school classes in China, stu uh, pupils already have to wear some kind of a frame of their head which controls the activity of their brain so that the teacher can see on a screen if they are listening to his talk or just dozing off and so on. That's just the beginning. I mean, the potentials are absolutely incredible here. And uh, so then, how are we to fight all this? Ah, now comes my final pessimism. I don't have a simple, clear answer. All I know is that neither although they should be used. Yes, I am for market regulation, welfare state, and so on, but neither market nor 
state apparatuses as we know them, I think, can do the job. So I will just, to conclude, propose to shock you a little bit a combination of two things which have this very obscure totalitarian associations, voluntarism and terror. First, voluntarism. The only way to confront the threat of ecological catastrophe, I think, is by means of a large-scale collective decisions, which will run counter to the spontaneous, immanent logic of capitalist development. I refer here implicitly to Walter Benjamin, who wrote in his thesis on the concept of history that today the task is not, in this old Marxist term, to be on the, on the train of progress and so on, but to pull the emergency brake on the, on the train. We no longer can afford this old-fashioned Marxist alliance, history is on our side. No, it's not. We have to act in a voluntarist way. By this, I mean with no foundation in some objective tendencies of social development and so on and so on. And this, I want it combined with terror. Don't be afraid. I'm not for new communist terror. Just the opposite. My idea is, what if in some sense, the United States are right to denounce, now in their pursuit of Julian Assange, to denounce WikiLeaks as a terrorist organization. In some sense, they are. They are break, clearly breaking the laws, disturbing proper relations, you know, and so on, and so on, and so on. But I think that, you know who is for me? I know how provocative I am now. I'm advocating terror. Yes, but. My figure of the terrorist is uh, the informer. You know, this lowest idea of a uh, whistleblower informer who denounces you and so on and so on, that's what we need today. This type of traitors are maybe the only authentic heroes today. Now, you are quite right to ask me, but is this not a crazy utopia? Will people be mobilized in this? sense. My answer is maybe, probably even no. But my only answer is that it is even more utopian to think that we can somehow manage to survive without similar radical measures. My dogma is that to think that somehow we will manage, don't worry too much, go on, somehow it will go, that this is the true utopia today. You know, it's no longer ecological threat, digital control, and so on. It's no longer some, something happening in third world countries. It, it's just slowly progressive. Look what happening, happens now in Australia, in India, and so on, and so on. It will just go on. And I just pray that a not too large catastrophe, ecological or whatever, will be enough to awaken us, if you want. But I'm a pessimist. I'm a pessimist, and that's good, because to conclude with a personal thought, I think that today, to be in a good mood, you have to be a pessimist. Why? Because a pessimist doesn't expect a lot. But from time to time, nice things happen. And that's beautiful, you know, like, oh my God, it's not all so bad. If you are today an optimist, it's the way to suicide. You are all the time. So just uh, what I... To finish, if you allow me half a minute, even less improvisation. What I'm, I'm very traditional, even conservative at this level. I hate this obsession with good life, happiness, and so on and so on. No, happiness is for pimps, whatever. I hate it. I want traumas. I want shock and so on. The sad thing for me, okay, at my old age, it doesn't matter, is what's happening with... with uh, What's happening, for example, with sexuality today? Did you notice how today uh, passionate love to one person is considered almost something dangerous, outdated? The ideological message that we get from society today is be plastic, reconstruct yourself, try everything, make, uh, make experiments, and so on and so on. No, I think... What, what do I mean when I say I'm from, for a catastrophe? Imagine yourself not being in love. It's usually very happy life if you have a job and so on. 
you have your job, afternoon you go to, a, to a, a drink beer with friends, maybe a one night stand here and there, life goes on. Then all of a sudden you passionately fall in love. The same role can be also played by engaged in writing, scientific discovery, whatever. Admit it, your life is ruined. <laughs> you worry all the time, the peaceful times are over. In this sense, yes, I want a traumatic life where you cannot even sleep well, and so on and so on. I hope we, will be still, we are still ready to do it. I'm very sorry if I was too long. I'm very grateful for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, uh. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Slavoj. I now call upon Professor Tyler Cohen to enter the stage to conduct the interview with Slavoj Zizek. It's a pleasure for me to welcome Tyler Cohen back to Bergen, where he was a symposium speaker during the celebration of Holberg Prize laureate Cass Sunstein in June 2018. Tyler Cohen is Holbert L. Harris Professor of Economics at George Mason University and Director of the Mercatus Center. In 2011, he was named in an economist poll of experts as one of the most influential economists of the last decade. And Bloomberg Business Week has dubbed him America's hottest economists. He's co-author of the blog MarginalRevolution.com and host of the podcast series Conversations with Tyler. Please take it away, Tyler. Uh, before you begin, one thing, let me express my admiration for him. I'm a strange communist like Marx, who said that one can learn more from a conservative like Balzac than from all progressives about economy. I think that our only true partners, the true leftists today, are modest, intelligent, honest, skeptics, conservatives. This morning he provided the best, I'm grateful for it, the best definition of myself. He told me that he considers me a moderate conservative communist. My gratitude to you. <laughs> you. I would like to pursue this theme. Thank you for your remarks. The assigned topic was why I am still a communist. I think, in fact, what you argued was why I am no longer a communist. And you can be thought of as favoring a kind of social democracy with more effort directed at climate change. But before we get to psychoanalyzing you, let me start with a simple factual question. So yes, you, you yes. cite China as the biggest success story of communism, but is it so successful? It has right now the per capita income pretty much exactly equal to Mexico, not so impressive. Yes. If you look at capitalist Taiwan, it has the per capita income of France, single payer health insurance, gay marriage, it's a complete liberal democracy. Life there is very nice. Furthermore, the last 30 years, the air in Taiwan has become much cleaner and the air in China has become much dirtier. So why isn't China the failure, Taiwan the success? And yes, it's a vote for capitalism, not communism. Uh, oh yeah, you're already asking me a question, okay. Yes, it's yeah, a your yeah, question. No, okay, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. First, uh, but if you compare what, what China 50 years ago, the difference is still absolutely shocking. Look at Shanghai, Beijing today, and so on. Second point, you know, uh, <laughs> Forget about per capita, compare prices and so on, and you will see that today's China, that today's China, the standard of living of middle classes, at least in the developed part, you know, numbers at this level don't tell a lot, but at one point I agree with you that, uh, that, uh, that uh, this, in the long term, this, whatever we call it, Chinese authoritarian capitalism or whatever we call it, will not work, I think. And China has put over a million people in concentration camps. Their labor force is already shrinking. Rate of growth is falling. So you are, in fact, 
a moderate right pro-Taiwan communist. Yes? No, but, okay, no, can I briefly answer you very yes. honestly? I see all your points, I, I agree with them, and, uh, but my point is this one, nonetheless, and now I want to ask you, if I may, Absolutely. a question. Yes. Okay, I know we exaggerate, and I'm well aware of, I emphasized it, do you remember, how easy it is to fall into this fascination by catastrophic prospect? Do you remember? No, you are not old enough. I am. Some of you must. Around 30, 40 years ago, most of Europe, especially Germany, I remember very well. No, was obsessed by Waldsterben yes, dying I of lived forest. In Germany then. And I remember the cover of Spiegel. They demonstrated exactly with statistics that 40, 50 years after that time, today, Europe will be without forests. I'm sad to tell you, but according to some statistics, today there are more forests in the world than at any point in the last 100 years. So I'm over aware of this fascination of catastrophe, but nonetheless, I think, and you can deny it, I will not, uh, when we communists take over, you will go to Gulag, but for different <laughs> reasons. <you know. laughs> Where will you go? You know what I, why I'm <laughs> glad to talk with him? <clears throat> that, you know, in today's politically correct climate, in typical Western academic institution, you cannot talk like that, you know. <laughs> no, but ser seriously. But I nonetheless see these threats, and I could go on indefinitely, like digital control and so on. Things are serious there, the extent to which we are manipulated already and so on. Ecology, immigration, and did you notice, I am not a simple humanitarian there. I just don't share this this simple optimism, open on hearts and what? All the poor will move to Europe and whatever. So how, very simple question, I will try to cut myself short. How these three domains that I outlined, I think at least in the long term, they need a more radical, something will have to happen. Do you, probably you don't agree. Do you see them as serious threats? Are you still a Fukuyamaist in the sense of we just make a system function a little bit better? I'm skeptical there. The threats you mention, I all see as serious. But ecology, keep in mind, the communist nations were the worst the polluters worst. and uh, still are. Yes. Surveillance, the worst culprits. China, right? Not a fully communist nation. But nonetheless, surveillance is worst in China. No, I, if you're worried no. about genetic engineering and the reshaping of mankind, Biggest defender is likely to be China. No, I don't I, I even know, it may surprise you, and the exact data. I was shown by a friend in suburb of <laughs> Shanghai, already clinics. No, no, not, okay, sorry, I will not lose too much time. This yes. will interest you. I met years ago in Frankfurt Book Fair, one high guy from Chinese Academy of Sciences, and he gave me printed in English the short program, programmatic note. And it says, it shocked me, literally, the goal of biogenetics in China is to regulate physical and psychic health of the Chinese nation. They are directly doing it. What I only don't like is, don't just evoke China as this ultimate horror, we are basically doing the same, I claim. Let me now get to my theory of you. Now, there's an old interview I read with you, and I found this passage quite striking. Quote, and sympathetic, I should add. The movies I watch are often old Stalinist movies. The songs that I listen to are old communist songs. Dot, dot, dot. I fully admit it, but it is also my pleasure. Now, also, you're from Slovenia, you're from the Balkans. That part of the world has not developed ideally. There are mm. far-right parties in many places. There's been war. The Balkans are still mm. a disappointment. So there's a negative outlook on the world you're from. And I view your attachment to the communist label as a kind of nostalgia, like the old Stalinist songs, which you don't actually think are better than Beethoven. But it's some like the old East German women who love their Spreewald pickles, the old cars, the Trabis. And the communist label for you, it's like your Spreewald pickles, the Gorky. Uh, it's like the Trabi. And why not just cast it aside and live free? Why be so tied to your own nostalgia? That's my question. Okay, my counter question is then, 
that obviously what I read today around are nonetheless, I'm more of a pessimist. You see, we are coming back to this basic dilemma. But you need this nostalgia, right? Why not free yourself by jettisoning the nostalgia and take the next step? But no, no. If I were okay, your therapist, I, this is okay. what I would be asking no, you to do. Okay, uh, let's go on. What, I don't want to lose your time, but what really fascinates me in Stalinism is uh, how, if you look at it closely, how fascinated Stalinism was by uh, America. For example, do you know that, that's why I like Soviet cinemas, <coughs> that the absolute model of Soviet cinema was Hollywood. They had, des they had desperate plans in the 30s to build on Crimea, crime, crime uh, their own version of Hollywood, how they imitated Hollywood, and so on and so on. I claim that, you, you know, even explicitly, when Stalin was asked around 1930, his definition of a Bolshevik, he said, the one which combines Russian dedication to a sacred cause with American pragmatism, efficiency, and so on and so on. What, what, uh, uh, but, you know, behind this, what you call nostalgia is, for me, nonetheless, uh, it's much more traumatic, if you want it. I am the first to admit, and that's my, maybe we share the opinion here, that's my criticism of one of the criticisms of Frankfurt School. As I always repeat, look at Habermas. At his work, he began publishing in early 50s. Read all his work, and I don't think you will even guess for, from his published text that there is something like communism in East Germany. Frankfurt School, in a strange way, almost totally, I know there is Marcuse's book, Soviet Marxism, but it's very specific. And you know what makes it so strange? The central thesis of late Frankfurt School is a dialectic of enlightenment. Horrors of 20th century, uh, fascism, Stalinism, are not simply regressions to some dark past, they are deployment of a certain totalitarian, whatever we call them, potentials in the project of modernity itself. Okay, uh, but isn't Stalinism a much more traumatic example of this than fascism? With fascism, things are relatively simple, I think. It's a model of conservative revolution and so on and so on. But Bolshevism, which tried to do a radical emancipation and it turned into a traumatic nightmare. I think even today we don't have a good theory of Stalinism. That's what bothers me. Not any return to it. I will give you as a proof that it's not in this sense nostalgia. I will give you another example. I have such a memory. I always tell my friends jokes about life in the army. I served in the mid-70s in Yugoslav army. But you know, like, it was a nightmare, I know. But what fascinated me was, I never did I learn so much about ideology and my politically correct friends. For example, I wonder if some of you know, you don't have here any more military service in Norway. But basically, on the one hand, Yugoslav army was, as all armies probably, absolutely homophobic. You were gay, you were beaten by fellow soldiers every night discreetly before being thrown out. But at the same time, crucial, absolutely crucial, the entire life was totally penetrated by homosexual innuendos and so on. In my unit, we didn't say good morning. We say, I'll smoke your prick. Thanks, and after I finish with yours. So, you see, this, this, all these paradoxes, what fascinates me about ideology is, and this is where communism interests me, is how, this is why Yugoslavia, which was relatively liberal communism, interests me. Do you know that in Yugoslavia, it wasn't just we have our own ideology, self-managed socialism. I mean this literally. Slovenia was a small country, we knew everybody else, nomenclatura. This is sounding like more nostalgia to me. Army tales, we talked about smoking the prick, right? Okay, but, 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 uh, the lesson I learned there, I don't care if you call it nostalgia, the lesson I, and I will tell you where I see real nostalgia today. The lesson for me is how an ideology can function not only 
even if you don't believe in it. But you, it is prohibited to believe in it. This was the beautiful paradox of ex-Yugoslavia. I had two friends who worked in the Central Committee of the Slovene Party. They lost their job, you know why? Because they were stupid and took the ruling ideology too seriously. But you know who are for me, change the topic, but along the same line, the true nostalgics today. That's why I don't like the novel. This will again okay. hurt some of you. Uh, Margaret Atwood, Handmaid's Tale. This is for me true nostalgia. It's what Frederick Langston called nostalgia for the present. It paints this horrible near future. It doesn't raise the crucial question. But she's still too fascinated by our permissive societies and so on and so on. You know, for, uh, sorry, These go are on. side issues. If I visit your debate with Jordan Peterson, it's on YouTube. I felt you won that debate. And it's striking to me the discussion between one hour, 10 minutes, and one hour, 18 minutes. And in that part of the discussion, you say that you calling yourself a communist is a bit of a provocation. But now I'd like to draw a comparison. Take the writer who just won the Nobel Prize in literature, Peter Handke, yes. right? Sometimes called an Austrian, but he's ethnic Slovene. Ha, he is mother. He has sympathized with the Serbian atrocities. Yeah. And you are hard on him, correctly so. You don't give him the space of that being a provocation. He is so close to your world that you apply a more absolutist moral standard, and you want him to jettison his Serbian nostalgia, and I am submitting that but communism... But I have no nostalgia. For what do I have nostalgia? I, I, my the God. attachment to the label communist. You can do everything you want without that word, no. without the concept, uh, without having okay. to apologize Let's go step by the step history. Handke. You know the old yeah. joke, what's the difference between a communist and a Nazi? Tenure, right? <laughs> you mean university tenure? Or yes, not? it's a joke, but the point is, hmm. you no, don't I would, need communism. I think, you are much smarter okay, than let's communism. Go, let's go step by step. First, Handke. My yeah. criticism of him was very specific. And Even correct. before he got involved into what he got involved to, I didn't like the game he played. Uh, for example, uh, I remember his text from 30 years ago, 40, before, where he said, in Austria, everything is commodified. You go to a store, every brand of milk has a name. You cross the border to poor Slovenia. It just says milk with no brand name and so on. And what I hate is, we should agree even here, we what do. I call, uh, uh, through uh, borrowing the term of my friend, another Austrian philosopher, Robert Fowler, interpassive authenticity. You want to keep your well, good life in the West, but you like to be authentic through others. This is why we were very good. He was proud to refer to us, Slovenes, Handke, in so far as we were the modest, poor communists. The moment we wanted our own state, join European Union, we betrayed his dream. That's why, maybe you know, in the text, I quote this wonderful saying by Gilles Deleuze, si vous êtes pris dans le rêve de l'autre, vous êtes foutu. If you are caught into another's dream. And that's, for me, we should agree here, the big problem of Western academic lab. They're always searching for another place where things really happen. When I was young, it was Cuba. Then it was uh, a decade ago, Chavez, Venezuela, and so on and so on. No, nothing great happens elsewhere and so on. And to my Serb friends, I declare that they will see if they will succeed too well, he will betray them also. They will disappoint him. You know, this is what I, this is what I, this is what annoys me with Handke, if you, uh, if you ask me. But listen, talking about nostalgia, I'm sorry to tell you, but I'm not saying I am a, I was a great dissident. But now I will say something arrogant. If there are not some, some great dissidents from Eastern Europe here, then probably I can venture a hypothesis that I did more for the disappearance of East European communism that, than any of you in this room. I was for five years unemployed. I had to survive through parents and so on and so on. So I was there when it was needed and so on. And I'm even a little bit proud to say that the role I played at that time is that when you said we have problems, right-wing politicians, mm. yes, we also do it, but Slovenia is the only post-Yugoslav country where nationalists never took over.
That will it. I was, at that time, it will shock you, member of a party called Liberal Democratic Party. <laughs> and we did it. We, we pre as, but you know what's for me, the, uh, again, I return to that. Uh, I, I appreciate the, what okay, you have done for your country, me that but I feel my case How will is we deal with stronger. ecology? You really think that with market a little bit of that, it can be dealt? No, we need much more than that. We need more. We don't know okay, what to do. Okay, I call that more communism. You know why? People, idiots, tell me, not you. Uh, uh, <laughs> Other why, idiots. why don't you call it socialism? <laughs> Everybody is a socialist today. Bill Gates says he's a socialist and so on. It's meaningless. Socialism basically means today you care for society. Hitler cared for society. I don't care. I, you know, I just want to signal that, as you nicely said now, something a little bit more radical will be needed. That's all I'm saying. Sometimes, I, I, I love your books. I've read more than half of them, which Crazy. is a lot. Crazy, madman, madman. Uh, your gulag <laughs> sentence is redoubled now. But one thing I crave is to one day just see you writing about a question like, the electric tram in Bergen, should it go through a tunnel or not? <laughs> and you would not be allowed to mention Fukuyama. You couldn't use the C word capitalism or communism. And just analyze that question or look at a municipal bus system in Denmark somewhere. And those to me are in some here, ways here more maybe real questions. We have a misunderstanding because I will tell you why not this. This may surprise you, the answer. Yes. First, you know, I tremendous, this was the point, you know, when in my short speech, short, <laughs> when, I, when I said I despise, for me, the model of catastrophe today, is my friends, they cried, Takrir Square Syntagma, we were there, one million people, we were all crying, wonderful. I say F off. <laughs> what interests me, I hope we agree here, is what happens two months later, sure. when I'm, I'm all for this, uh, pragmatic, concrete problems. I'm not waiting for a big revolution. Uh, I just am, now this may surprise you for somebody who may sound so bomb bombastic and pretentious like me. Uh, you know, strange as it will sound, but I don't know everything. You know? <laughs> like, I'm immediately thinking in uh, literal terms what, what to do with so many factors. I don't know enough. I, I, I like this totally empirical, totally concrete empirical problems. I like paradoxes. For example, would you agree very briefly, maybe you found this in one of my books, I'm not quoting this as an argument for anti-capitalism. I don't know that. But there are some group experiments which fascinate me, which proves that you cannot reduce some forms of solidarity to money. A Jewish friend from Israel told me this. They had a kindergarten there, and... Uh, this story is apocryphal. People have tried to follow up on the kindergarten in Israel story. It's probably not true. Really? Yes. Are we talking about one when they made it, when they made pay even yes, less? Yes, we're not, we're not sure this is true. I've looked into really? it. Really? It's possibly true. It cannot be confirmed. But I, I accept the point. Yeah, Sometimes the, the, when the point has is a that price, I believe it surprisingly. I, and uh, when I talk about communism and so on, my God, I've written texts on it, and now I go on into it. Into, for me, communism is just as I emphasize, and the name of a problem is not a solution. I, you know, now I, I will say something that will shock you. I'm well aware. Oh, some of my communist friends admitted that even if we imagine something similar to communism, the mega problem will be envy and so on. And this is, who is one of the great guys, my God, the one who conducted Chile according to leftist mythology, not Pinochet, the economist, uh, free market, uh, who advised Pinochet according to... Arberger. No, 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 the big guy, the... Sorry? I think he only visited once or no, twice. No, no, I, I, that was not my it. point. But one of those guys, when reproached with the fact that, that, uh, but capitalism is unjust, you work harshly, you fail, your neighbor was late. He said, but that's why capitalism works. Because he said, your pride survives intact. Let's say we are two guys. I, we live in a just society. And if there is no luck and injustice, this means if you are richer than me, 
I have to admit that I'm more stupid than you. But capitalist injustice is a very elegant argument. Communism is easy in a way. You always have an excuse, right? Yes. The system screwed That's you why and you're always right. Now I will ask you, this is my big argument mm -hmm. against happiness. Do you agree if you are now like my study observer, you have your list? Of yes. Five. You remember when I argue about happiness against? Yes. I take as an example, and I was there, I talk with people. Husaks, Czechoslovakia in the 70s. Uh, uh, material needs were basically satisfied. Nobody was doing that. And as you said, you always had an excuse. There was too much rain or drought, communists screwed it up. Then, very important, you had a nearby country, West Germany, which was the ideal other, but it was not too far away and so on. That's why I'm against happiness. Happiness means no responsibility, relatively, com relatively comfortable life, you know. Because uh, after, already after Khrushchev, basically, with Brezhnev, you must know this, communists in power made a pact with population. They admitted we will never reach the West, but the message was, you leave us political power, we leave you your private niche where you can enjoy your life, and so on, and so on. The whole, I think that Khrushchev was paradoxically, don't you agree, the last guy who somehow paradoxically, you know, he was sincere in that, you must know it, United Nations speech where he, yeah, he, the last epoch where the ruling nomenclatura half still believed in communism. After that, it's a totally different logic of emancipation. Some of the communists in power, I love this in Yugoslavia, even referred to Marcuse Frankfurt School, they said, but you know, in the West you have commodification, alienation, here you can take it easy, it's more poor, and so on, and so on. You know, sorry, let I me, talk too much. Let me praise you some more. No! All your, no yes, all your no. books I've read, one of my favorite things in the books is yeah. how much humor you have, and in yeah, person, for this, whether I will speaking do, yeah. or over breakfast, for this I will share your selling gulag probably. Your, your humor, <laughs> which is based on insight, right, rather than any Youngman type of jokes, uh, is phenomenally good. Yeah. But here's what strikes me. You have the humor of a right-winger, of a right-wing moderate. So if you think of today's left, it is increasingly humorless. You're not allowed to talk about so many things. On gender, your views are much more right-wing than left-wing. Uh, that's uh, debatable, so I don't know what to wing yeah, is yeah. moving. When I sit down with my right-wing friends and they joke around, their jokes are in broad terms like yours, left-wing. Oh, oh, uh, my humor. answer to this, no, not humor critical is of you, it's a very politics. simple one. My, my answer to this is, that's why the, the, uh, the politically correct leftists are doing all possible to get Trump re-elected, if you ask me. F a little bit more years on this and we will be where we are, but let me add, as a sign of friendship to you, yes. another bad taste humor about you. <laughs> you are my friend, I like you. So when we communists take over, yes. uh, <laughs> nonetheless, because you are objectively guilty, <laughs> you go to Gulag. Okay. But as a special favor to you, you know what you got on better days in Gulag, on Shark Day? Some kind of disgusting soup, entrails and heads, half rotten fishes and sure. potato. Maybe or some bread in it. Don't exaggerate. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I will call from my Moscow center. Yes. And isn't it nice? You will get two plates of that soup. <laughs> <laughs> so do, you will do you agree you have an increasingly right-wing sense of humor and that if we're going to be but true But why Freudians, do we call it right-wing? When I was young, to this was left-wing humor. Irony. It is no longer left-wing humor. The world has then moved so much on. Worse for the left. for the worse. Okay, we're making progress. Maybe. You are indeed the moderate right communist nostalgia, rum state communist, who is maybe almost ready to abandon that final bit of the nostalgia. Don't count on that too much, because <laughs> I still think that the crisis will hit us. I, I see signs, that here comes my pessimism. I think that the situation today with new right wing, blah, 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 and here, as we already talked about it, I'm uh, very open, for example, do they exist here? Not, we talked about it, so-called incels involved celibaters. Usually they decry it as the worst, uh, may, uh, women hating fascists. No, they do something, I think, almost tragic. They try to turn their 
failure, and already this is politically incorrect to state today. You cannot uh, address a woman, almost it's prohibited, saying she is beautiful. You cannot say to a man, you are non-attractive enough, you cannot get any woman. But that's their experience, and I admire how, without any imminent violence, they turn this into a wonderful performance, especially clown cells and so on. It's a wonderful way to survive a pretty terrifying predicament, and I don't buy that they are automatically neo-fascists and so on. Concerning feminism, and by reproach to me too, is not they are too radical and so on, but it's an upper-middle-class fake. They don't really, the American feminism should first do, I hope we agree here, a little bit of a good old-fashioned Stalinist, you will say again, nostalgia, <laughs> self-criticism. You know, you know you, you, <coughs> there are so many things of American feminism. Do you know, for example, they supported American invasion of Iraq, that it will help women? Well, we know today that the situation of women today in Iraq is much worse than under Saddam. Saddam was a brutal despot, but relatively secular. Women had uh, today, it's my, I mean, it's, I, uh, I, I, I don't, this is what bothers me. Second problem, you will again say I'm conservative here. Fuck <laughs> it, I don't care. <laughs> the problem with political correctness is for me that questions which are questions of, uh, not manners in a, superficial sense, but of customs. Here I am, as you know, a Hegelian. Hegel always emphasized the basis that holds society together are unwritten rules, customs, and so on. Political correctness tried too much, too much to legalize it, you know. You are allowed to call this name. Uh, they try to, for example, let me give you a provocative example, you know it, to, to provoke you. Uh, once I problematized, how is it called, uh, 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 this idea of consent, even bureaucratic consent. You have to state it on a selfie, uh, sign before mutual agreement. And they say, oh, so I think we can rape women, we don't need consent. They totally misread me on the opposite. I just claim consent in itself is good, better than nothing, but it doesn't solve the problem. There is so much pressure, violence, which can survive the form of, the form of consent. Even if there is a formal consent, sexual exploitation can go on and so on and so on. My problem with LGBT+, plus, as if I'm attacking them, no. The problem I see there, I wonder if you agree, is this one. I have a problem with identity politics. The problem is that uh, the idea of Predominant, there are many LGBT plus who are extremely good theorists, uh, persons. But the predominant view is the one of this one, I simplify it. There is some kind of a multiplicity of gender positions, flourishing, it's almost the Maoist version, you know, let uh, the 100 flowers blossom, let 100 uh, boots, gender, bisex, trisex, and then evil patriarchy comes, imposes the binary division. Let's get rid of these, and some of them even establish a list, 30, 35 positions. My God, and then they say Freud is outdated. If there is anything to learn from Freud, is that sexuality is in itself antagonist, traumatic, shady domains, and so on and so on. Th that's my first point. My, so it's as if, what bothers me in LGBT plus is as if, if we get rid of social pressure, we are, we get some kind of happy sexuality. The first presupposition that I adopt here is because you do what you desire. My God, didn't they read Freud? How do we know, how do you know that you really desire what you think that you desire? There are all the ambiguities here. My second problem, and that's the theoretical one. Let's move into Hegel a little bit. Maybe you know my line. Uh, uh, LGBT plus, it's all about plus, no? Because the ordinary LGBT theorists are for me two British empiricists. Plus is for them simply, maybe we don't yet know all identities, let's leave it open. You know, like maybe there will be other gender identities, we will include them. No, as 
I got this, I forgot her name, I'm sorry, from an Australian LGBT theorist, very intelligent lady, who wrote to me, but what if plus itself is a subjective position? You can be a plus in the sense of, you know, at a distance, doubting, and I think this is feminine position at its stronger, I will go to absolutely everyday level. That's why the most provocative woman's answer is, why do you love me? Because well, there is no answer to this question. The moment you answer it, it's not true love, by definition. The, if, I, if I tell you why I love you, then it becomes a matter of, you know, so what I'm saying is that I just try to complicate things. Why not move to Singapore? Yeah. It's a wonderful country. And yeah. if you ask which nation has the quality of government and the thoughtfulness yeah. and the long time horizon to actually deal with ecological problems, are they not near or at the top of the list? And therefore, you and I can join hands in embracing Singapore and presenting it to the world. You know, it here I, I may be but too pretty good Marxist, but isn't it that Singapore nonetheless enjoys its role as a structural an exception? I don't think you can expand Singapore to Indonesia. Already with Malaysia there are problems and so on and so on. Well, every country is different, but clearly Singapore no, no, has stronger worked, there. Because right? you know, I, I read somewhere that Singapore port is even at some point it was the busiest port in the world and so on which means they are a kind of a nodal point for the countries around them and so on. I doubt, second thing, maybe I have here too much liberal sensitivity, but nonetheless, you know, it's a kind of a, the way I would define Singapore, you may disagree, is, is fascism <laughs> with the human face. A very human face, it's consensual and so on, but there are so strict limits, even at the everyday ridiculous level. For example, I was there with my son who wanted some chewing gum. We get, went to a store and they laughed at me. Are you crazy? You have to go to pharmacy. We went to a pharmacy, they said, okay, where do you have doctor's prescription? I said, no, I'm... Uh, but this is fine. This is not fascism. Singapore did that because too many people were leaving the chewing gum on the subway doors and it was creating a problem. Maybe yeah, they yeah, overreacted. Yeah, yeah. Now you if are your exactly criticism of Singapore no, is about the no, chewing no, no, gum, no, what I, I say, come join me at the food stalls, right? Where? In Singapore? Yeah, I know where all the best ones are, right? Jump yeah. on board, forget the communist thing. Uh, the nostalgia can be for Singapore 13 years ago, which in some ways was less crowded, right? It's a better no, nostalgia. No, 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 but, but again, don't you see where my communism comes seriously? It's precisely, I, it's not where you think, I don't think there is any link with me clinging to the name communism and my nostalgia. Those times, I'm well aware, were more or less a nightmare, I mean. I'm, listen, I, I, one reason against nostalgia is that I was jobless. Although, you may know this joke, something wonderful happened. When people ask me uh, who is most, who, which was the key factor for your relative success in the West, I told them communist oppression. Because I applied for a job when I finished my postdoctoral doctoral studies in 1973, and this was the harsh line. I couldn't get the job. And then I was, for a couple of years, unemployed. I was looking for contact in the West. Without communist oppression, I would have been now an unknown professor in city city of Ljubljana, Slovenia. <laughs> Sometimes you remind me of Leibach, the Slovenian rock group. They're, they're my friend, my God. I, I'm with course. them from late, from late 80s, yes. and now things get complicated there. You know why? Because many leftists who support them are nonetheless afraid. Of course. Okay, they are staging totalitarian rituals. What if some people will take it seriously and so on? And but once they were asked, are you a fascist? And one of them said, I am a fascist like Hitler was a painter. What answer is that? I don't know. <laughs> but... Why can't they just say, I'm not a fascist? And then you could say, I'm not a communist. And you and Leibach, and we could all meet in the food stalls of Singapore. No. Taiwan, <laughs> have a nice time, right? Work on better batteries so solar power can really save us. We could have the government subsidize, you know, better battery technology. I know it's not all we need to do, but... And no, then no, think no. about that no, no, electric no. tram Sorry, and the tunnel, another diesel from thing. the cruise ships I can the tell harbor. you from my personal contact with Leibach yes. that they are... 
they don't mean it as an ironic spectacle. They are very serious in their harsh line. That's what I like about them. They are not, don't be afraid, we are not really totalitarians, it's just one big social game and so on and so on. But at a certain point, I didn't want to join them because they wanted me, you probably know, two years ago when they went to uh, North Korea. North Korea. No, it would be too much. Sure, of course. I, I didn't want to too do Too communist it. for you. Yeah. <laughs> no, but nonetheless, you know what was so interesting with Leibach? Here you have the complexity of ideological process that all this fear, will they be manipulated by radical right and so on, they never were, whenever they are popular, it's they never the right. I, I know what the right wingers, at least in Europe, are listening. It's not uh, the German version of Leibach. There was some influence. Do you know Rammstein, the sure. group? Links, links, they are left. And it's a beautiful, the right thing to do for the left to appropriate this horrible totalitarian sounding stuff and so on and so on. The right wingers that I know, they think beautiful romantic songs, apolitical usually and so on and so on. But still, you know where you, I get your point, of course. I still, when you said no, something more will be needed. F you, what more? Tell me. <laughs> you say, no, 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 it's not, I know ecology and so on, digital control. Have you any idea what? What more will be needed? What do you think? That ecological party will be elected? I hope so, maybe. I That's was told why that I in like Bergen, it's 20% electric cars. Now, what I don't know what Bergen did to <coughs> get that, but many parts of the world could learn from whatever has been done here. And no, we're I at 20, I, uh, let's work yeah. at 60, right? Yeah, but uh, on the other hand, my only not criticism of Norway is that uh, you have oil, gas, and so on, you know, you can, of course. we can, I would like to learn from <laughs> Norway, but I would like even more if you give me your natural resources. You know. To earn from the oil and then divest from fossil fuels. Although I have one, one argument for strange. you here. The good thing about Singapore is that they have no natural resources, no? Well, they do a lot of refining there, so. Refining, yes, yes. but no, no. Uh, Not that I'm aware of. But what, what made, made it? Is it kind of a one uh, oxide uh, a incidental conjunction? That's what I would have maybe said about Singapore of uh, this uh, uh, Chinese proclivity to hard work and English legislation or what? There must have been some unique combination there. Keep right? in mind the Chinese themselves felt at first that the Chinese who went to Singapore were kind of the losers who were not doing well in China, the poorly educated peasants. But the Singaporean government thought, let's invest in human capital. When? Which government? I'm talking Lee about Kuan Lee Kuan Yew. Yes. Yeah. And it worked for the most part. But what then your problem with China? Because do you know, you must know this, that at the beginning of <laughs> these reforms, Deng Xiaoping came to Singapore. And Everybody, he, everywhere there, they saw it and said Singapore should be a model for... It is time for China to liberalize. I don't see them doing that. They seem to be moving in the opposite direction. Here, uh, now we touch the true problem. Sorry, now I'm not losing <laughs> time. You know where I am a pessimist? Some of my liberal friends tell me, oh, China achieved so much with full political liberalization, they would have achieved even more. I doubt it. We don't know the counterfactual. Speaking of counterfactuals, I, love I have them. a question for you about Donald Trump. Yeah. So you initially said, well, if Trump wins, it could be good because it will revitalize the left. He did. There was then another, he did uh, it. another yeah. article where they, people asked you, do you really mean it? And you said maybe a year ago, yes. But I look at the Democratic race. Front runner number one is Joseph Biden, age, I think, 77. Yeah. He was vice president for yeah. eight years. Mayor Pete is now number two because he took a moderate stance. Sorry, who is name? Mayor Pete, Buttigieg. I'm so sorry, I don't know, know how to pronounce that name. That's I, I'm not sure I do either. But he, he, he's mayor from South Bend, Indiana. Yeah. To me, you know, yeah. a, a perfectly fine candidate. And the Democratic conservatives are in the ascendancy. And where the Democrats have gone hard left is identity politics. And that's exactly the thing you hate. So why has it been good? The uh, Democrats. Eight years of Trump, maybe ba, 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 ba. eight years okay. of Trump. We don't have time to go it, but let me be specific. <clears throat> the Democrats who go for identity politics already Hil Hillary tried this against Donald Trump. Yes, and that so, was more radical. Against, against Bernie Sanders. Sure. That's why I admire Alessandria Ocasio-Cortez, who said something very ingenious, you must have read it, who, who said, 
uh, recently endorsing Bernie Sanders, I endorsed him not in spite of him being an old white man, but because. Her idea was this one. Bernie Sanders can get us, we don't need, dem center Democrats are obsessed, if you go too much to the left, we lose this centrist vote and so on. Trump did exactly the opposite. I think the target of the Democratic Party should be those impoverished white half unemployed workers who otherwise would have voted for Trump, not those middle of the road and so on and so on. Trump is a genius here, how he broke all the rules and so on, because do you remember how often in his campaign when he said something, I know, preposterous, horrible, liberal press said, oh, Trump just shot, him, shot himself, he's, he's over and so on. No, it's not over. Trump proved that sometimes the only way to majority is through extremes. It's not always that center works. But I worry here there's a parallel, your views and pronouncements on Trump and on communism. So in the case of Trump, you think, well, I can say this, I have a vision that work, will work out a particular way, the democratic left will be revitalized. But, but what we've gotten is the Maybe worst of the They left. may lose, the identity but politics it was revitalized. And the moderates are on the rise. And then there's a sense of, well, I can attach myself to communism, I have a particular theory, that will work out some way, it will tell us we always need more when it comes to ecology. But that to me seems like the Trump prediction. We know from the work of Philip Tetlock, it's just very hard to predict the future. So why not I, I'm stand the first up directly to agree for just the right values? Like take Greta Thunberg, right? I don't agree with everything she says, but her core message is correct. She is unambiguous, she's to the point, yeah. it's not I ironic, don't, yeah. there's okay, not some okay, complicated exactly. theory. She is a contemporary communist for me, fully. You He's know why, no, but you know what, I know, forget, you know what I like you about her. Magnus Carlson okay, is a communist. But you know what, what, what I like about Greta Thunberg? First, you remember some media in <laughs> Europe claimed, uh, uh, tried to blame her parents, you know. They are manipulating her. My answer was, I hope they do, I hope. Why shouldn't we, the left, also manipulate? But what I like is precisely, I didn't like her at the beginning, you remember, when she played that innocent girl who uh, uh, is telling us that the emperor is naked. But did you notice how in the last year of men, she has this almost a little bit of diabolic, uh, aggressive <laughs> smile. I like the mean Greta Thunberg. I don't like the good, innocent girl. And I also refer to her as uh, this, uh, uh, you know, for me, she is deeply feminine, but not the usual notion of femininity promoted by the media today. Holistic dialogue. Uh, no, no, no. She is quite dogmatic, insistent. That's what we need today. And I don't need anything more. Okay, we can debate the name, but I think that, that what she is doing is definitely Communists today are for me, Greta Thunberg, uh, 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 Assange, and so on. Incidentally, do you know the story? I must repeat it to you, I hope all of you don't know it, when I visited him two weeks ago in prison. It's wonderful, I couldn't believe it, I'm sorry if some of you know it. I was sitting close to him like this in open space at the table. A friend brought me a cup of coffee, a plastic cover. I took the cover off and drank some coffee and put coffee back on the table, in two seconds, literally, a guard was there, very gentle, soft, no terror. I just said, please, sir, put the cover, plastic cover back on the coffee. I asked afterwards, I didn't want to cause problems there, why? They told me, you were sitting opposite a son an evil man, it was for my own good, they told me, they wanted to block the possibility that evil men like Assange will grab the boiling coffee and throw it into my face and so on. It's, no, but I think, okay, you these like are my heroes You today. like alternate scenarios, right? No, there is no alternate here. I'd like for Greta you to tell us, exist, uh, 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 what's the alternate scenario where you write books which are not so much pastiche, not so much ringing together of disparate elements, but you become a kind of realistic, non-Hegelian preacher almost, like Greta Thunberg, return somewhat to your Catholic roots, embrace your right moderate side, retire in Singapore, and go gallivanting if off with I me will, to no, the first stalls uh, 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 where we, we share your sense of humor with my right-wing no, friends. First, first, what does that alternative scenario Singapore look like? It's Ecuador is too hot <laughs> for me. If Air I retire, Singapore. if I retire, and I'm not lying to you now, two, three times I've written about it. I want to retire to the part of Norway, which is not even Norway. 
I'm not kidding. I wrote about it. It's my ideal place. Long here bien Svalbard Island. <laughs> That's my ideal place. It's half empty, nothing there, and it's very good prospects for survival, because you know the joke. It's prohibited to die there. <laughs> because... But last question. No, 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 but the quite seriously. The scenario where, where you evolve in this manner, with your right-wing sense of humor, what does that Why look like? Why do you call what it has right to happen? Wing? It's the humor of my youth, my yes, God. Yes, thank you. What has to happen? for that scenario to come about. I'm not saying it will happen, but what does that science fiction world look like? What would you but have to first see in the world? I will tell you, the, no, no, I'm not trying to make cheap propaganda for myself, but I did try to practice this, you know, or one of my books, which was not full failure, but close to a failure, my rewriting of Antigone. Did you read that no, one? No, I have not read ah. that one. I love that one. You know what I did? <laughs> I took its precisely alternate scenario. I took, and you will not like the third version, I took Antigone. Mm. But you should like it because it's very pragmatic. I took first, it, it, it's pure alternate logic, like Kislovsky's film and that uh, Lola runs and so on. First, I took the way the story you have in Sophocles, which incidentally is not the original story. The original Greek myth is totally different. Okay, you know what happens. I will not repeat them. Then, at the moment of her big conflict in the middle of the play with, uh, with Creon, I play alternate reality. She wins. Creon says, okay, you are right. Let's allow the burial. In my scenario, what happens is that as Creon suspected, uh, 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 there is, again, a revolt, again, a traitor. The whole of Tibet, the city, is in ruin. And at the end of the second version, she walks desperate in the city and uh, cries like that famous, you know, shit line of Antigone. I was created for love, not for war, that. And the chorus answers her, fuck you, bitch, but that's what you created. Then comes the third version. Last word is for you, but you have 38 seconds, so you okay, okay, yeah. The third version that you will like, I hope, is while Creon and Antigone are fighting, the chorus steps over, said, you are both traitors uh, ruining the city, you should both be liquidated, and they establish a kind of Jacobin terror, and they're both liquidated. Nobody likes this. I don't think Lavoie, so. thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> but don't you suspect me, I still have zero seconds, but don't you suspect me, how come that you don't have, don't you trust me, that fear that now I'm talking soft, but if I get too close to power, you will see the Stalinist side of me. You don't suspect me of really be a bad guy. You no, trust me. I don't. I think your attachment and almost obsession with plenitude and being What's generative. Plenitude? Pl of ideas. A young idea. The yeah, sense yeah, in yeah, which yeah. you are generative, which is a personality feature and a temperament and neurological in you, that that so overwhelms whatever oppressive tendencies you might have, that if you were appointed dictator of whatever, you would just go off and write more books, and you can't help it. And I yeah, admire here, this. Here, I am in some sorry, ways just I will tell you a story, very brief one. <laughs> Don't be afraid, no time. That's what I like. In, in even I hope you will like this. In Mar My favorite passage in Marx is, maybe you know it, 1870, Paris Commune, there was a dream that maybe there will be a European revolution. And Marx wrote a letter to Engels, I love him for that, <laughs> where he says, oh my God, they want a revolution now, but, but I haven't yet finished the capital. <laughs> Not now, I have to finish my book. That's the true spirit that I <laughs> Exactly, and that's why I trust you. Yeah. Now we have a method for questions. There will be questions from the floor and questions from Twitter. Your questions from the floor are to be questions, not statements, not proclamations, not political platforms. We are here to hear this man, so I will cut you off if it is not a proper question. But before we get to that, we have four questions on video, at least one of which is too long, and I'm told they're friends, you're friends, but you need more enemies, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely, I'm well, First, we start here, with yes. those questions. Let's get to those, how will we, and then will questions hear from the them or how? and well. microphones will come around, and it will all be managed efficiently, because this is Bergen, Norway. <laughs> questions from the video, first video, please. 
my line of questioning for Slavoj has yeah. to do with the Marxist critique of political economy. First, in relation to Marx's historical materialism, uh -huh. do you think there have been any major changes in the basic relations between economic infrastructure and more than economic superstructure in capitalism between the mid-19th century and today? Has the role or weight of the economy in shaping social history altered over this period? Second, if you were to rewrite Marx's critical rendition of economics for the 21st century, what components of it would you prioritize updating, revising, scrapping, or replacing? What would be some of the distinctive features of your own contemporary critique of political economy? They are all my friends. I know who will be, so I will. <laughs> On the other hand, these are difficult theoretical questions. We need another two hours. I would just say that, yes, I agree with, I cannot go into it now, with uh, Adrian's point how the relationship between ideology, economic infrastructure change, and so on and so on. But all I can do now is point out what he knows and most of us know, that already in Marx, and that's one of the critical points that we need to read Marx, what I really admire in Marx, because it's not what you idiots, not you personally, but think, <laughs> It's his theory of commodity fetishism. It's not simply we believe in fetishes. Not the, no, the Marxist theory is that we, bourgeois subjects, in our actual life, we are usually pragmatic Anglo-Saxon utilitarians. The fetishist inversion is in how we act our reality is structured. Marx has a wonderful theory where it's not this enlightenment vision, you know. Uh, we dream mm -hmm. illusions, the other thing is real life. No, we can be very, so, uh, to repeat a joke that I'm sure you all know, but it renders perfectly the point. Uh, you know, that story that I always repeat, Niels Bohr and the horseshoe, you know. Niels Bohr had a horseshoe uh, at his country house across the entrance door, superstitious item, and a friend asked me, why do you have it there? Aren't you a scientist? Do you believe in it? You know what Niels Bohr's answer. Of course I don't believe in it. But I have it there because I was told that it works even if you don't believe in it. <laughs> That's how ideology works today. At this level, the extent, and maybe you would agree with this, the lesson of Marx is that, that's why, interestingly enough, commodity fetishism, he never calls it ideology, because it's something very strange. It is a system of beliefs and so on, but objectified central part of infrastructure itself. Along those lines, I would say, we have to go further than Marx, and so on and so on. I don't want to... Second video question, please. My question is about communism. So, along with Alain Badiou, you are one of the philosophers who reinvigorated the philosophical discussion of the idea of communism with a series of books and conferences and events. And so, I'm wondering. And, and so, I'm wondering um, about your thinking about that project and the potential for communism now. I'm also thinking about your. Um, editions of collected works of Lenin, um, different um, volumes that you've produced um, with Lenin's works, and, in, and some of your um, events, also your event with um, Jordan Peterson. And so my sense is that uh, for the most part, um, you, are, you work within um, the um, communist tradition in addition to Hegel and Lacan, but yet sometimes it seems like your position is that Every part of the 20th century experience has to be um, erased, has to be forgotten, has to be um, overcome, that we go back to the beginning and we don't need to use anything that we learned in the 20th century. And other times it seems like you're precisely actually um, learning from the 20th century and using some of the, um, the writings of Lenin and the achievements of, and the examples from, um, from European history in the 20th century. So I would hoping, I'm hoping that you might clarify um, how you see the potential for communist politics today, right? Not just communist philosophy, but communist politics today, what kind of organizational forms you think it requires, and whether or not um, there really is a potential in communist movement. Maybe another way to say this is, how do you imagine um, the end of capitalism? Uh, again, another two hours <laughs> answer question. Uh, uh, what I would say is that 
looked close, first, I didn't, my God, I'm not crazy, I'm, I didn't edit collected works of Lenin, I haven't <laughs> read them, never. What interested me is Lenin at a very precise moment. What fascinates me in Lenin, and I said this in both of my introductions to some texts, that uh, first, Lenin's time is over. I don't play the boring Trotsky game of, you know, this crazy dream. Oh, if only Lenin were to survive two years longer, he would have made a pact with Trotsky, Stalin would be sidestepped, and so on. No, the deadlock was there from the beginning. So, but what interests me in Lenin, and maybe that's what we need today, is this totally pragmatic voluntarist spirit. Isn't it clear that in 1917 it was a total mess? Lenin often didn't know what to do. Uh, some even liberal communists praise his state and revolution. But what he says there is something that he immediately abandoned then. What interests me is especially Lenin in 21, 22, and this was the big failure of the October Revolution. They want the civil war. And then it would have been my moment, okay, now it's everyday life, invent new forms if you can, they failed. But uh, Lenin was at least the one who, he said openly, our situation is totally desperate. We don't have any formula. He didn't have any trust in the future. He, he saw this total openness. That's what fascinates me, but I'm not preaching in any sense uh, in any sense, the return to it. So my idea, unfortunately, I'm here maybe a little bit more, let's call it pessimist. I really think, and incidentally, in this metaphor of returning to zero level, I quote Lenin, who wrote in 21, 22, a wonderful text where he said, we, nothing worked. Then he said, it's not that we should stabilize our achievements, <laughs> but we should return to the zero level, begin from nowhere. And quoting data, which also you mentioned, the horrible, uh, the, the fact that the only livable communism today, communism in the formal sense, the Chinese one, means ecological problems, more digital control, and so on and so on. We have to begin in some sense from the zero. Lenin already did this not just as a good direction. If you are a dogmatic Marxist, you can show that Lenin totally overturned Marx and so on. In this sense, Lenin was not the one of the fidelity to Marx. He pretended to be, but you know how religious revolutions also work. All great revolution proclaims itself return to origins. Martin Luther, the greatest original, oh, we just want to return to the original <laughs> Bible and so on. So, no, I think, again, that uh, we have to, with all objective study and so on, see the good, bad sides, but the 20th century communism was ultimately a failure, an third, absolute failure. Third video question, please. Hi Slavoj, Paul Taylor here. Hope life's treating you well. My question relates to the role of academics as independent critical thinkers. In my experience within the UK sector at least, academics over the years when confronted with a growing bureaucracy, growing commercialism, have behaved like lemming type creatures or quizlings to use a couple of references your Norwegian audience will be familiar with. <laughs> and given Brexit as a recent example, there's very little genuine debate over all the complicated topics around leaving the EU or not leaving, as the case may be. And there's a level of conformity and groupthink that reminds me of uh, the movie Stepford Wives, if that rings a bell with you. So my question to you is, having a you've experienced Yugoslav communist system and you've experienced something of the UK academic system. Which of those environments do you think is most conducive to genuine, critical, engaged intellectuals? Thanks. Uh, it's a very nice question and again, you will accuse me of nostalgia, <laughs> but I would say in the last decade, 80, 1980s, 
Yugoslavia was better. You know why? There was not yet a total economic fiasco, and that was the beauty. Uh, the, from 1980, at least, maybe 82, the ruling nomenclatura were already preparing for the fiasco. So, uh, actually, I think that some of the governments in different republics were pretty good. You know why? Because they knew they don't have democratic legitimacy. So they tried to do, to learn some legitimacy. Things, for example, a very sad story. In mid-80s or 6-7, uh, a, a, a gay organization formed itself in Slovenia. Immediately, uh, a delegate from Central Committee came there, yes, you are progressive, we are for mm -hmm. them, do you want financial support, and so on and so on. Then we got democracy, 1990, the first thing that the city town council, whatever, dominated by conservatives, is abolish all help to this gay organization. So in some paradoxical sense, it was a golden era, I would say, the second half, but I don't have any illusions. It's not that communists were good or so on. But communists in power knew they were fighting for survival. This is incidentally also how I read the explosion of nationalism. Milosevic got this. Nationalism, communist nomenclatura had a problem. Democracy is coming. How to regain some type of democratic legitimacy without cancelling themselves as nomenclatura? The answer, obvious, was uh, uh, paint yourself as uh, a defender of uh, national interest and so on, nationalism and so on. Uh, on the other hand, I must say, what makes me so depressive, and the United States are big enough, are not the worst, but especially UK, I don't know how it is here, it's this pragmatic turn of philosophy has to serve concrete social needs. Labour Party, Borden Thatcher, began this in England. My friend philosophers are telling me, you got Labour representatives coming to university philosophy department and say, we will give you more money, but we will just match it if you get some money from uh, private companies and so on and so on. But what I like about today's, I think, this is certainly not a traditional leftist idea, that what's good about academia is precisely that it's a space with no concrete attachment to any needs of society. You can go crazy, you can freely debate, and so on and so on. And this is uh, more and more difficult today. Even in Germany, they are telling me. My good friend, conservative but bright, Peter Sloterdijk, he told me to get more money, you know what he likes to do? Business weekends. Years ago, he went for a weekend to uh, Volkswagen top managers and explain them, you know, this bullshit, what's going on today, postmodernity, the situation, <laughs> and so on, and God, I didn't ask. So what I'm saying is that this reminds me in an uncanny way to the worst years in ex-Yugoslavia, 70s of the communist oppression. This focus on also human sciences has to work for society, experts solve problems. No, we don't need that today. We need precisely academia, humanities in their useless character. The, the only, also in sciences, I think, if you look closely, isn't it that practically all big inventions, as far as I can judge, emerge even in a, either in a totally contingent external way, usually some military contract, or as a private hobby and so on. So, uh, uh, what I advise you, if you are here at the universe, university, is don't believe in this mantra of uh, you are here, bourgeois spending money, hard-earned workers' money, and so on, uh, be more useful. No, what's great about university is they are not useful in the immediate sense. That's why, that's what we should expect from you academics. All great things, again, to use the guy whom you mentioned this morning, uh, how do, John Elster. Yes, He had Norwegian. this wonderful term years ago of states which are necessary a byproduct. It, it just comes, you cannot plan it. Academia should be a place for this. Last video question, please. Hi, Savoy from 
Australia. Mm. So my greetings. You've often spoken critically of the Hölderlin paradigm, where the danger lies, there grows the saving power. The idea that disaster harbors the seeds of its own, overcoming the catastrophe provides both the negative index and even the opportunity for redemption. It's a model of historical catastrophe or crisis that's often associated with a kind of dialectical salvage along pseudo-Hegelian lines. I'm saying pseudo-Hegelian because you've done so much to argue that Hegel himself resists this kind of negative eschatology. But you've often suggested that Marx falls prey to this way of thinking. One of your criticisms of this paradigm and is that it exaggerates or misconstrues the exceptionality of the present and misunderstands the nature of the crisis and of crisis. Specifically, it underestimates the capacity of capitalism to absorb and feed on its own crises. Can we still hold to the idea of capitalism as being its own grave digger? Can you elaborate your critique of the Hölderlin paradigm in the light of the present when we can see the, the danger, the ravaging effects of global capitalism all around us to the extent that maybe danger itself is not the word we can use any longer and where previous models of crisis seem not to hold. Specifically, and here's my, my question, is there a concept of revolution in the present context that does not fall prey to this paradigm? Uh, again, it's a mega difficult question. Just to explain to you, you know what, what she, uh, Rebecca Comey, incidentally, here I am a sincere, not politically uh, correct uh, feminist. I'm organizing next October in New York a big Hegel conference. The majority will be women. And I already brutally apologize to people. No, no, I'm not politically correct feminist. It's simply that the best Hegelian studies come from women today. So, okay, so uh, uh, Helderlin paradigm, you know this uh, passage from Helderlin, the German romantic poem, all the time quoted by Heidegger, wo das Gefahr ist, wächst das rettende Aus, where the danger is the greatest, the point of salvation is also near and so on. And this is a model for the usual revolutionary thinking, even in Marx, pro proletariat zero level exploitation, poverty, but hey, 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 there is a chance that you turn around into salvation. I'm here a Hegelian, if you ask me. I much more believe, and I will not go into it now, it's another half an hour, how do I apply this to what I was telling about catastrophes, apocalypses, and so on, the post-apocalyptic <coughs> Vision. Hegel's problem is exactly the opposite one. Mm -hmm. The big attempt at liberation happened, French Revolution, and for Hegel, I don't totally agree with him, but nonetheless, it turned wrong, Jacobin terror and so on. So, what went wrong? Hegel is not a crazy optimist, as bad as things are, eh, eh, you should see a chance for the better, no. Hegel's basic insight is exactly the opposite one. No matter how good an idea or a project is, we can be sure that it will be somehow, <laughs> that it will turn wrong somehow. And I think what Hegel did to French Revolution, we should do to 20th century communism. First, we have to still, we disagree here maybe, uh, I still see some tremendous utopian emancipatory potential, but it went terribly wrong with Stalinism and so on. And we shouldn't play these cheap games just corrupted Stalin or even, did you notice how Marxists are often even racist here? They put the blame on Russia is too close to Asia. So it's a Asiatic barbarism which is responsible for it. No, it things went wrong. And we have to begin thinking from this. What's then the solution? Simply return to more modest previous model of society. This is my vision today. Yes, we are approaching a crisis, but we cannot simply revitalize the 20th century communism. We can, we should rethink it, rethink it radically. I'm again a Hegelian, a Hegelian pessimist here. Hegel is for me a thinker of deep 
distrust. Hegelian dogma is everything turns wrong, so only this whole delicate Hegelian theory of repetition, only the second time to do it again, you have to do it again, maybe you have a chance the second time if you learn the lessons of the first time. And I think that's what we need today. This much more modest spirit, don't wait for a big revolution. It already happened and it got screwed up. We now take questions from the floor. I will call on you and please wait for the mic. This way you can be captured on I YouTube. I love you. You are deeply a good Stalinist. No. <laughs> I am. Yeah, yes. yeah. Fuck in democracy. You want order here. Yeah. <laughs> in the front here, there's two people with hands up and we'll do them in sequence. These two. Oh, no, right there, these two. I'm Jesse Tobelty from the philosophy department here at the University of Bergen. Now, you came here today to tell us that you are still a communist. That's not an affirmation, that's a reaffirmation. So my questions are, are two. I've got, uh, the first is, um, what has prompted this reaffirmation of your commitment to communism? And the second question is, has your commitment to communism evolved over the years, and if so, how? No, uh, uh, I, I think I implicitly, maybe I failed, answer this in my, whatever you call it, bombastic word, speech talk or whatever, that it's simply, the big dilemma is for me this one. It's still, again, as I said, the Fukuyama dilemma. We are confronting a series of problems today. Global, among them, not only global migrations, uh, the new forms of domination ba based on digital universe, ecology, and so on and so on. Is the existing liberal democratic capitalist system strong enough to cope with these problems or not? And the, my answer is unfortunately no. I'm not saying now that this means anything, go, let's reinvent, let's return to 20th century communism. I'm totally, I totally agree with you that all these problems reappeared, only now we are discovering all the ecological catastrophes, go to East Germany, whole areas are there totally contaminated, go to parts of the Soviet Union which are even now uh, prohibited and so on and so on, but to put it, <laughs> to put it very simply, you know, I, I was never naively pro-communist. My diploma work in this was early 70s, late 60s, was rejected by university. This was still communist time as not Marxist. This may surprise many of you, but you know that I began as a Heideggerian. <laughs> my, my first book was on Heideggerian language in Slovene. No, I don't uh, today. I would settle accounts with the book in Nazi style, burn it, you know. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that uh, this is, to put it in very simplistic, common sense terms, this is my problem. That's why I'm so distrustful about this usual liberal optimism. Like, you know, of course, all my sympathy go, goes with, for example, refugees. But don't turn it into a humanitarian problem, but look at but not in this politically correct way. You know, Western people like to, in, from developed countries, like to blame themselves. Like, yeah, yeah, whatever happens in third world, it's colonialism, we are guilty, and so on. No, we are not responsible, because what one should never forget, here I'm still, I'm sorry to disappoint you, staunchly pro-European Enlightenment tradition. Even political correctness itself is, I think, a myth directed application of something that is part of European tradition of enlightenment. You cannot even, I think, imagine something like political correctness outside, outside the Western tradition. So again, so that I don't get lost, uh, my, uh, my, my, it's not that once I was a traditional, authentic, communist, but I was very lucky in Yugoslavia. You know why? Because I don't have any illusions about ex-Yugoslavia. I'm not nostalgic. But you know <coughs> what was our luck? From early 60s, borders were 
maybe for literally 20 dissidents, but other side were completely open. As a student, late 60s, I was going once at least every two months, if not more often, often by plane or by train to London, Paris, or Munich to buy books and so on. So for us in ex-Yugoslavia, the end of communism was not this traumatic experience, oh my God, now we know what it is. No, we were there all the time, going to the West, no illusions, and maybe this was my luck, that I had no illusions about Yugoslav, communism, I didn't buy the stupidity of some Western communist. Yugoslavia is different. It was an authentic, democratic communism. But, it, but borders were open, so I also didn't have great illusions about the West. And it goes to my honor. Check it up. It appeared in 88, 89 in New Left Review, a short text of mine, uh, 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 the East European Republic of Gilead, reference to uh, 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 Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale, where it was clear to me that I predicted there explicitly that East European post-communism will take this nationalist, fundamentalist turn, and so on, and so on. So again, it's not that I ever was a traditional Marxist, because you know what was my formative experience? I remember when I was a young student, the big conflict in Slovenia was between Marxist, Frankfurt School, and Heideggerians. Heideggerians, more dissident, Frankfurt School, official Marxist. Then the big French wave exploded, so-called structuralism, post-structuralism, and both sides, dissidents and the party officials, use the same language, attacking it. That's made my what made my identity <laughs> through the French experience. But I'm sorry if I disappointed you, but again, my point is this one, simply, that we are approaching problems, catastrophic potentials, and it will not be able to deal with it within the liberal democratic capitalist system. That's, that's my, my foundation, very simple one. Yes. Directly in front of her, then in the front row over here, and we'll need to compress the answers a bit to get through. I'm sorry, I'm very sorry. Yes, I will, I will go into my Buddhist mode, you know, <laughs> this bullshit like clap with one hand, <laughs> listen to my silence or whatever. <laughs> Please, sorry. Um, so I think we can agree with that. Uh, the idea of a stateless uh, communist uh, society is kind of stupid. Uh, so, could we apply the uh, idiot king in our community? The, the idiot king? Sorry, Oedipus. What? No. Idiot, king. idiot king, right? Yeah. Who is this? Okay. No, me no, no like, like uh, uh, you talked about this in like uh, theocracies, where where it becomes tyranny when. Uh, the uh, the experts becoming t uh, gets in charge. That's the worst. Yes. Yes, uh, that's the worst. I agree with that. So we need like an idiot king to be on the top, so the expert can make the decisions under him. Uh, could there uh, that solution uh, be in a communist society? And what would it up to a point? Look yes, like? very good question. I would refer here to my Japanese friend, very intelligent. Read him. His books are translated most of it into English, Kojin Karatani. And he, okay, it's provocative, what he, but he said now the passage from bourgeois to proletarian democracy, I quote him, is the passage from voting to lottery, you know. That there must be a dimension of lottery chance and so on to prevent expert rule and so on. So I, I, I believe that in every whatever we call it, more authentic democracy and so on. An element of chance is needed. And that's why from ancient Greece to Venice, which was not exactly democratic, but nonetheless, they were also obsessed with lottery. How did, was the, how do you call the boss? Doge, how do you? Yes, Doge. Yes, how was he selected? An incredibly- A nine-step process, very yeah, complicated. Incredibly complex, but it was a mixture of checking the person that he's not corrupted with lottery, with lot, no? 
I, I, so if on the other hand, you know, it's, he is not yours, but you were once their colony. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, Denmark, no? Kierkegaard also was well aware of this, you know. I read in a biography of, how do you pronounce it correctly, Kierkegaard. Okay, we in the corrupted <laughs> West say Kierkegaard. He was, I think, I read in a biography once called by the king, and like, what lessons should I learn? And he expected some deep theological, philosophical wisdom. Kierkegaard, no. You must learn how to be polite, how to say polite platitudes, and so on and so on. I believe in empty manners. All our humanity is based on empty manners. And this is what absolutely fascinates me. I've written a lot about it. How, you know, this, I call them sincere hypocrisies. For example, I don't know how you do this here, but in my country, let's say, I'm sorry, it's my old story, some of you may know it. Let's say, no, but we are, I don't know what's our, let's say you are a millionaire, I'm a poor guy. You invite me to dinner. The bill to a restaurant, the bill arrives. In my country, it's absolutely crucial to go through this empty ritual. At the end, the bill arrives. We both know that you will pay, but I have to insist a little bit. No, let's at least share it. But not too much. Yeah, not too much, yes. Because in my ultimate evil, once I did this to a friend of mine, it was very evil. He insisted, let me pay, and I said, okay, pay. And he was, he was totally desperate. He had to claim, oh, I forgot my credit card. But, but what I'm saying, isn't this something wonderful? This is specific human communication. You make an offer, a gesture, which is uh, expected to be rejected. But nonetheless, it has to be made. And all our communication is like this. Like, you walk on the street, you stumble upon a friend, and you tell him, oh, uh, nice to see you, how are you doing? Usually, this is a total lie. You are thinking, why didn't I see him five minutes, uh, five seconds before to cross? You know, and for this, we need, I'm asking, uh, answering your question, I'm not lost. For this, we need idiots. There is no civilization without these idiots. Two final questions, one here, one on Twitter, 30 second answers only. Middle class opportunist, you want to combine left and right, you know. Yes, question. Yeah, my name is Gisle Selnes, Department of Comparative Literature. Uh, I had prepared a complex question concerning the unorientables of your last book. Uh, ah, oh my god, I like it. Because, it yeah. but, uh, I took the message from the moderators, and I just keep this short and very yeah. concrete. The signs of a communist future. You mentioned two names at least, Greta Thunberg and Julian Assange. So I would like to ask you uh, very specifically, how do you believe that the hearing about the extradition of Assange will turn out at the end of February? And how do you think the outcome would affect that sign of a possible communist future? 30-second answer. Yeah, a very difficult question, because I hope Julian, he doesn't have a TV, cannot watch it, no, because uh, I'm more of a pessimist. We are trying to do what can be done, organize things here and there, but the entire establishment is against him, and so on and so on. But, uh, but nonetheless, there are good signs here and there. Even Paul Rudd, the previous Australian prime minister, turned against extradition and so on and so on. So if you ask me about his concrete fate, I will do, but what can I do? All possible, I'm a pessimist. I think we should just hope that at least the after effect will be up. Twitter question, super quick, 30 second answer. Norway too suffers from the stigmatization of communists. And even though the poor are getting poorer and the rich getting richer, with far right parties and parliament, workers are reluctant to turn to the left. How can we best turn the proletariat towards our cause? 30 seconds, please. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, first, uh, when you say poorer, poor are getting poorer, rich are getting richer, but still, you know, Norway is still an ideal for many of us, if I may say this, you know. <laughs> like, this I got from my good friend Varoufakis, 
who said, you know, everybody protests austerity and so on. But for us or you in the developed West, austerity means, oh my God, purchase power fell for half a percent and so on. Austerity is what happens in Greece where it fell for 30 percent and so on. What I would say is, again, uh, uh, Alessandria Ocasio-Cortez formula, uh, don't... Uh, uh, I'm totally again for all this new identity, not identity, but uh, feminism and so on, gay rights and so on. But uh, don't fall into this gap of cultural politics. Find a way. Find a way to uh, uh, find a link with the majority, because poor are getting poorer and so on and so on. Is there a political party? talking for them, but not in this traditional Marxist way, it doesn't work. But, you know, because so many in the United States, politically correct people, you can see that their political correctness quite often has a secret class bias. They don't say it, but the politically incorrect are the poor, primitive people, working class, and so on and so on. It's a much more, it's a much more complex situation, and I will say now, something that you will like, <laughs> but for this you will get to gulag for liking it. <laughs> <But> <laughs> the problem is <coughs> much bigger one. Does the left, I always, I was there in uh, Occupy Wall Street and I was asking them, what do you want? Do you have a project? Many of them just get a vague idea, less corruption, big banks are corrupted. What do you want? Do you, are you Fukuyamaist, a little bit more efficient system? Do you want old social democratic welfare? Do you want old style communism? And I will be very critical left, leftist. I'm the first one to admit that the left doesn't have, I don't, I'm not talking about legalistic details, but a general vision of a future society. Oh I boy, don't see. Do thank you, you see very it? much. Oh, okay. And thank you all for coming. You see him. You see him how evil he is. He interrupted me exactly at this pessimist point, you <laughs> <Yes>. know. <laughs> and then he stifled and brutally with his fascist boots oppressed <laughs> the good message that I wanted to finish it. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes This concludes the program for this afternoon. I want to thank Slavoj Zizek and Tyler Cohen for their insightful and thought-provoking contributions and for making the 2019 Holberg debate a truly memorable event. Thank you also to the audience in the aula and for those of you who followed us on live streaming and for taking part in the discussion, either in person or, which didn't happen via Twitter, and last but not least, thank you to Adrian Johnston, Jody Dean, Paul Taylor, and Rebecca Comey for sending the video uh, questions. You. Yes, I must severely criticize you. Okay. You were not Hegelian enough. <laughs> Hegel <laughs> means that you turn into self-relating, self-reflection. You know what okay. would have been a Hegelian step here? No. When you said end at the end, then why didn't you say it? I would love you. And thanks to myself for doing <laughs> all this. One yeah. step to be Hegelian. Mea culpa, Sorry. mea culpa. <laughs> Thank you.